Yes, and they, they did that in collaboration with the Black Liberation Collective, which Explain is... Explain that one, because that, that one's adorable. The Black Liberation Collective, isn't that, isn't that the group that somehow thinks that white people are inferior because they don't have enough melanin, yeah, so they it was don't started get Yeah, the... it was started by a woman who, who said exactly that. She's a black supremacist, and she said that the reason that, the reason that white people are inferior is because they don't have enough melanin in their skin, and melanin apparently is this agent. It's, obviously, it's a pigment, but it's apparently this agent that transforms cosmic energy into wisdom. I mean, she's completely... <laughs> You can make up. You can make up your own mind about her. And then the other person who started the Black Liberation Collective is a, a woman who used to work for the University of Toronto Students Union, who is now being pursued by that students union for embezzling three hundred thousand dollars of from 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 that organization with the help of a couple of her cronies. Well, why let a few facts stand in the way of abolishing racism? Yeah. Well, they also they university. also are perfectly willing to promote violent means of social transformation. And the university claims that it's in favor of safety, you know, because they've gone after me because my refusal to use compelled pronouns has apparently made the campus unsafe. But they're perfectly re willing to take advice from the Black Liberation Collective. And not only are they willing to take advice from them and not disavow them, despite their support for um, violent means of, of social revolution, they're also pushing equality of outcome on their employees. And, and the people who taught their mandatory anti-racism and anti-bias training program said outright in their training material, which I have copies of, that any institution that doesn't have equality of outcome as, as part of its characteristic at every level of the power organization is corrupt and should be restructured. <laughs> Wow. But that pales in comparison to my refusal to use compelled pronouns, I obviously. I don't understand how this gets so far. I just don't understand how no one has, there's, there's no rational thinking involved in the administration and the, and the people that are implementing these ideas. I just don't understand how it gets to the point well, where... Well, th things get to terrible places one tiny step at a time. You know, if I encroach, I, if I encroach on you, and I'm sophisticated about it, I'm going to encroach two millimeters. I'm going to encroach right to the point where you start start to protest. Then I'm going to stop. Then I'm going to wait. Then you're going to calm down. Then I'm going to encroach again, right to the point where you protest. Then I'm going to stop. Then I'm going to wait. And I'm just going to do that forever. And before you know it, you're going to be back three miles from where you started, and you'll have done it one step at a time. And then you'll go, oh, how'd I get here? And the answer was, well. I pushed you a little farther than you should have gone, and you agreed. And so then I pushed you a little farther than you should have gone again, and you agreed. And if anybody's interested in this sort of process, and this is a horrifying book, if you want to read about how this process works, you can read a book called Ordinary Men by Robert Browning. And Ordinary Men is about, Browning was interested in how the Nazis trained their, 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 they, how they train people to kill, basically. And so Robert Browning studied this police battalion. It's a very interesting book. So these were middle-aged German men. So they, they, were, they were raised and educated really before Hitler came to power. So they weren't indoctrinated Nazis. They were policemen. And when the no Nazis went through Poland and then, and then needed to impose their brand of order on Poland, they brought policemen in. They brought this battalion of, of middle-aged policemen in. And... Uh, their commandant, their commander, was by all accounts a pretty decent guy, and he told them that because it was wartime, they were probably going to have to do some pretty terrible things, but that they could go home if they didn't think they were up to it. So there was no compulsion, you know, this wasn't a Milgram experiment or, or an experiment where you had to obey orders. The guy who was giving the orders said, look, this is going to be awful, but you can back off. But the guys thought, well, I'm not going to leave my comrades here to do the dirty work, you know, which is kind of a virtue in a, in a perverse way. And then Browning details how they went from ordinary policemen to guys who were taking naked pregnant women out into the middle of the fields and shooting them in the back of the head. And they were physically ill during most of the transformation process. You know, they started out by w rounding up uh, the Jewish men between the ages of 16 and 65. Well, you know, you can kind of understand that because you're at war. And then, well, then they put them in stadiums. And then, well, then they had to shoot some of them. And then they had to load them on cattle cars. It was like one step at a time. These guys were having a dreadful time of it. They didn't stop. They didn't stop. And so that's how things get to where they are now, is that, I mean, I know they're not at that point, and I'm not trying to make the case that they're at that point. Well, you're one of the but, first people that's sounding an alarm, that there's, there's a real issue with controlling people. There's a real issue with controlling dialogue, controlling the way people communicate, 
and that these ideologies, although seemingly innocuous, they can take you down very dangerous roads. Yes, well, seemingly innocuous ideology, those words, innocuous ideology, those words do not go together. There are no innocuous ideologies, and they're, they're forms of pathological oversimplification, and they're also clubs. I mean, I mean, the kind of clubs that you hit people with, as well as the clubs that you belong to. The advantage to me being an ideologue is that I can explain everything, I can feel morally superior, and I know who my enemies are. And you know what you're supposed to do with enemies. They're not your friends, right? You move against them. And, you know, we're approaching a situation, and this has already happened, I think, more in the United States than in Canada, although our countries are competing to see who can cross the idiot line fastest. You're, you're in a situation in the U.S. where 50% of your population won't talk to the other 50%. That's not good, and I would say it's more pronounced on the left liberal side because they regard everybody who voted for Trump as essentially as an enemy. It's like, hey, people, that's 50% of your citizens. You might think about talking with them. You know, uh, people you can't talk to, those are enemies. Well, ironically, I really truly believe that one of the big factors in Trump's rise to power is that people are sick of this oversimplification and this ridiculous ideology coming from the left like that this enforcing yeah, they're sick of being, identity politics exactly and so they've chosen an identity politics that opposes the identity politics that they think is disgusting yeah and that's just starting it's just that's starting. Star yeah, that's it right. is just starting that's right well if you teach if you teach one side to play identity politics de facto you teach the other side to play identity politics and I've seen more and more people who are center people, as far as I'm concerned, pushed to the right yes. because of the continual insistence that by their mere existence, they're part of the perpetrator group. Just by being a white person who is somehow or another successful, you are a privileged person, you're a part of the elite, you're part of the 1%, you're part of the problem. Yeah, you're part of the oppressors. Yeah. Absolutely. You're and, an oppressor and, and, by being just a, just by a person being. with a, a home in the suburbs. Well, and it's also extremely annoying for people who've worked really hard and, and who've made the requisite sacrifices to become successful along some dimension to have that immediately attributed to their oppression. Yes. And it's not, it's not obvious that that's something we want to do. It's like for the social justice warrior types out there who, who might be listening— it's like, do you, are you really willing to say that every single person who's accomplished something has done that as a consequence of oppression? That, that's, again, what the Soviets claimed with regards to the, to the successful peasants in the 19, in the, just before the 1920s. It's like, well, the peasants weren't emancipated. They were serfs until about 30 years before that. They were serfs. They were basically slaves. And some of them had clambered up to the point where maybe they could own their hut and a cow and could, you know, employ someone. Well, the Soviet claim was, well, that's all theft. You got that all because you're an oppressor. And so then the Soviet intellectuals went into the villages. And just imagine how this happened. So imagine a village, a small town where everyone knows everybody. And there's maybe 10, 20 people there who are moderately successful. Okay, and so you can imagine that those 20 people have like 100 enemies at the bottom of the socioeconomic distribution. Useless, horrible people who are jealous and resentful about the fact that these people have been successful. Okay, so now the intellectuals come in and say, property is theft, success is oppression. And then they look for the people in the village who are willing to move against those 20 successful people. Well, those guys at the bottom, those 100 resentful, jealous, murderous people at the bottom, they're just waiting for an opportunity to go kick down some doors. And that's exactly what they did in the 1920s. And as I said, they wiped out all their productive peasants. And then 6 million Ukrainians starved to death. They had posters. The Soviets produced posters in the 1930s that said, essentially, um, don't forget it's wrong to eat your children. So, whoa. Yeah, whoa. There's nothing about the Soviet, there's nothing that you can imagine that's horrible enough so that it matched the reality of what happened in the Soviet Union between 1919 and 1959. And, you know, the West knew about this, too. Early, Malcolm Muggeridge in the 30s was documenting for, for England, for, the, for English newspapers, exactly what was going on in the Soviet Union. The bloody intellectuals didn't admit it till the mid-70s, you know, with the exception of people like George Orwell. So... Why do these patterns repeat themselves? What is it about human beings? Well, we like things simple. We like things simple. So, and often, like... 
a simple explanation is a good explanation unless it's too simple, but distinguishing between simple and too simple is no easy matter. We like, we like to know who's our friend and who's our enemy, and we like the feeling of unearned moral superiority. And then unearned moral superiority. Unearned, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the distinction. Why earn it, man? Especially right. when there's no such thing as earning anyways. So, and then, I mean, there's deeper and darker things that are underneath that. It's like the, the human proclivity to pull down those who have more than you. It's like these kids yeah. on the campuses who are claiming identity with the oppressed, you know, at somewhere like Yale. It's like, how in the world you can speak of oppression if you happen to be at Yale is beyond me. I mean, first of all, you're North American, which puts you in the top 1%. And then of North Americans, you're in the top 1%. So you're in the top 1% of 1%. But yet you, you want that. You want to have all the power that goes along with that. And you want to have the moral superiority that comes from being a, a representative of the oppressed. So that's exactly what you want. You want all the power and you want all the victimization at the same time. Well